Welcome back, Superboy Beyond fans. Uh, we're doing one of our commentaries today. Uh, we are going back to the Season 2 vault, as it were, with Superboy's Deadly Touch. This is a really good episode. Um, it's a classic, you know, Lex Luthor, you know, disrupts Superboy's powers episode. You know, it's, it's a cliched, you know, trope but what they do with it is so good um hmm. it's also hey. our se our second appearance of darla in the series yeah let's face it we always love to see darla and yep. this is a funny episode and she's always good with the comedy i don't remember her funny moments from this one it's been a little while it's, we talked it's about usually it. the stuff it's usually the scene with the spider right yeah that would be fun That'll be fun to rewatch. Uh, yeah, this is a very um, Silver Age type plot, really, isn't it? You know, it's the mad scientist Luther. He's using a contraption of some kind to accelerate Superman's powers, uh, which I guess is a tiny bit similar to something like All Star Superman, um, which is kind of interesting. But maybe this would have killed Superman or Superboy rather if they hadn't have figured it all out before the end um yeah it it's is also episode. an appearance by uh peterson so that's that's a, that's a plus there the only problem with this is this is the last appearance of lex and darla until season three yeah it's funny that they weren't in more of season two i, I maybe they were learning from season one maybe they didn't want to give him too many episodes until they knew what he could do with the role. Uh, I think maybe with Scott Wells, they gave him a little bit more than he could handle at a certain point, especially with just his acting ability. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's why they were a little bit kept more careful with Lex in season two. But let's face it, season three and four, he's in so, so many episodes that it makes up for it, doesn't it? So yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, let, let's get started. So for, for those of you who are just joining us for, for a commentary. Uh, this is not a typical reaction video. You're not going to see any of the episode in in the uh, in our uh, our podcast here. Uh, there will be a very highly uh, filtered version up there. Okay. And that is just so you can keep in track with us because let's face it, we all know phone rings, got to run to the bathroom, need a snack, doorbell rings, whatever. And it's hard to get back in, in, in sync with us. So it's there for that. So I'm going to count you in with a three, two, one play. And as long as you hit play with us, um, the episode, you'll be in sync with us. So Superboy's Deadly Touch. That is season two, episode 14? Uh, 10. 10. Episode 10. Yep. Season two, episode 10. It is disc. It is on disc two of the season two box set. And it is the first episode on that disc. So I'm going to count you in with three, two, one, play. Three, two, one, play. So, yeah, it's been a little while since we've seen this episode. Um, we could have sworn that we'd done a commentary on it before. Um, but I guess not. Maybe it's one that we lost the recording or something. But um, we think we've just discussed it enough times that it's just somehow we've got it into our head that we have. Um, yeah, which is the same thing that happened with both the Mixers Pitlick episodes. We could have sworn that we'd done them a long time ago, but apparently not. We have now, though. Now, I have commented on this before. He's not wearing anything other than a pair of glasses and a nun's habit. How is it that Superboy doesn't say Lex? Yeah. It's one of those things like we can explain away not recognizing Dala, but 
because technically he's not met her yet. But Lex, I mean, he's he's literally just wearing glasses and a nun's uniform. I mean, I I know that, you know, I've made the joke many, many times, but I guess glasses in the DC universe are just capable of completely changing your appearance to the point where nobody re will recognize you if you wear glasses. So I guess there's an element of the comic booky nature about this, but yeah, it doesn't quite work, does it? Yeah. We ought to ask Carrie Bates and Mark Jones about that whole whole thing because they did write the, the episode. Mm. Maybe they figured that the uh, makeup would be a little bit more <laughs> extensive, let's say. The reason it doesn't work, though, is because obviously if the audience can tell that that's Lex and Dala immediately, Superboy should be able to, too. Yeah. It's, it's just the fact that we work it out before Superboy does that makes it a little bit irritating. It's it's like when you watch like a murder mystery and you work out who the killer is halfway through the film and then you've got to sit through the second half where everybody's just acting like they have no idea who did it. It's just it gets annoying. Any kind of mystery movie like that, if you work out the ending too soon. Well, I mean, that that's the whole thing with the old Columbo episodes. You know, we knew who the killer was right from the beginning. Yeah. But it was a clever know, format. It was how catch him rather than who done it. And it was, uh, yeah, very, very clever writing. I kind of wish there were more shows that did that these days. I think the closest I've seen in recent years is Monk. But they had sort of a combination of some episodes you would know who did it, some episodes you wouldn't. And it was it was fun that they changed it up a bit. But I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head. There probably are some. Hmm. The only see, now way I just want to see Tony Shalhoub play Columbo. And I do not want a Columbo reboot. So please don't get any ideas, whoever owns the copyright for Columbo. <laughs> yeah. The so only way that the whole thing with Lex in the uh, in the nun's habit would have worked is if he was sitting in the bus the whole time. Yeah, he could have just sent Dala out to tell Superboy what was going on because Dala was doing a good job as well. Like I've said it before when we've discussed this episode, Dala is, is doing a pretty good job in that scene at playing the nun because she's lost her accent. She's she sounds a little bit more posh. It's, it's, she's putting on a voice and I think she did it very well you know Dala on her own totally could have handled that situation it's not a Otis or a Leo situation where they'll probably mess it up if you do yeah she's more Miss Teschmacher than, than Otis or Leo absolutely yeah, except that, Miss that... Teschmacher was never quite as bad a person as Dala Dala's a pretty terrible person whereas Miss Teschmacher is she almost seemed like she wanted to get away, but didn't see any other options. Which, you know, it's what she says when she saves Superman, you know, why can't she get it on with the good guys? So it's, I don't think Dala would have gone for the good guy, even if she could have. She seemed to well, enjoy the life of crime. Well, we don't know what would have happened, you know, to her after the, uh, the whole incident with uh, know thine enemy. No, what? Yeah, yeah. No, I enemy. would like to think. I would like to think that she uh, maybe turned a corner at that point. Like she saw the error in her ways, and that's why she didn't go back to Lex at that point. I'd like to think that she's turned a corner and has become more of a good person now. But um, yeah, we have no way of knowing. Yeah, for all we know, she could have. She could have gone and 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 met met a lawyer. And got married and had kids by now. Yeah, we have literally no idea of what Dala could be up to. I do think it's interesting, though, just how well she plays into the disguises, though. I know, I know I've said it already in this commentary, but I think she was good as the nun. You know, it shows that Dala was plenty capable. And it's a shame she didn't get more scenes like that, really, where she was uh, given a bit more to do. And, this is, and the funny thing is, this is the second time that Dala has used a religious iconographical uh, disguise. <laughs> what was the other one? 
she played the priest doing the uh, the the last rites to Lex when he was being taken to the, the electric chair. Right. I guess just nobody suspects the clergy, or at least they didn't back in the eighties. <laughs> Nowadays, I think you know people would be looking a little bit more closely. I'm so glad that Peterson's in this one. How many episodes was he even in in season two? Can't uh, have been many. Two or three, Let's maybe? Let's sentence to death. Bizarro, Bizarro. Parts one and two. Microboy. Okay, so that's three. Four, Boy's including dead, this dead one. Touch. Huh. That's at least five. I mean, that's not terrible. I guess we just like the character so much that we just wish he was in it more. I guess no matter how many episodes he was in, we'd want more, especially since we know he's never going to appear again after this season. Yeah. Man, I wish he'd got a job at the Bureau or something. Like Maybe he could have been like, you know, the Bureau of Extra Normal Matters Scientific Advisor or something. Like That could have been interesting. Plenty of places they could have put him. We don't know, you know, maybe it was a scheduling conflict. Maybe he got a part on a different show and he just didn't have the time or whatever. We have no way of knowing, really, do we? We'll have to get George Chakiris on and ask him. Yeah, we'll have to uh, see if he's on Twitter or something and ask him. I do like the set in this episode as well. You know, it's not overly huge, but they've lit it in just a moody enough way that they can hide the limitations of their set. I think they do a decent enough job. Like Shots like that of um, Peterson, I just think it's quite visually interesting the way they've got the lighting playing. I still say that, you know, Peterson knows that Clark and Superboy are the same person. I think he's too smart not to, especially considering how close he is with both of them, really. I mean, I guess he's more so with Superboy than Clark, but I mean, him and Clark have definitely interacted, I'm sure. Oh, uh, this is the creepy moment. Comes down the stairs, pats Leo's skull on the head. Mm. Ugh. It's a nice little thing as well, because he's doing that, almost torturing Leo even after death. And he does that on his way to torture Dala with a spider. <laughs> so it was like a little clue about what Lex was about to do just before he did it. It's quite interesting. I wonder if that was intentional or if it was just, uh, you know, maybe Sherman Howard just saw the skeleton and thought that it would be a fun little moment if he just tapped it on the head as he walks past. Too many questions about this show. We really needed a making of documentary or something. Or just commentaries on season two and three and four. You know, we had a couple on season one, but not enough. I would have loved some commentaries on season two from the cast and crew. Even commentaries just from the writers and directors would have been super interesting for us, I think. Oh, back to the spider, which is clearly dead. Or plastic. It, If it's a plastic one, it's a very good plastic one. <laughs> and I guess Andy just there said, like, I thought Clark would be here. Or something like that. I didn't quite hear what he said, but I guess it's a little moment they had to add in the script because otherwise you'd have to be like, you know, Superboy can't leave this room. Where's Clark? Somebody you think would notice. So I guess they need to add a throwaway line just so that people aren't questioning it. 
Yeah. You know, at least it, I assume it, that's what it was for. In the silver and early bronze age of comics, you know, Superboy would have had one of his robots impersonating Clark. Yeah, it's almost a shame that there aren't some more of the, uh, you know, early Silver Age comic booky elements in this show. You know, we've had Crypt's Night Kid and Yellow Perry, and we've got characters like that. But it would have been cool to have one episode where Superboy builds a robot of himself so that he can be Clark and Superboy at the same time. Maybe it goes crazy before the end of the episode and he has to fight it. You know, that could have been a fun little episode right there. It was only a matter of time before his heat vision flared up. Mm. No pun intended. I do really love that helmet thing that they've got on him. I've always thought that was just such a cool little prop. Slash piece of costuming. I'd like to know what the hell they made that thing out of. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that I kind of wish you would make as an action figure. <laughs> you can make the gloves and stuff that he's got on. and It might be quite difficult, though. You'd have to build it from scratch, I imagine. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Would be a cool one, though. Pretty unique. It'd be very few people that would know what it's a reference to. I've always loved that moment there. Darla gets Lex back. You know, it it just shows that in the beginning here, it is kind of a, a, as dysfunctional as it is because he's a criminal. There is a loving relationship between them, you know, playful. Yeah. You can see that they are kind of meant for each other. And I've always loved this scene as well. This is this is Sherman Howard really getting to getting to play, you know, over the top evil. Hmm. Yeah, Sherman Howard just played the mad scientist Luther to it just absolutely perfectly, didn't he? Mm. Now, let's face it, it's about as far as you can get from modern versions of Luther. I mean, I guess Jesse Eisenberg had a little bit of the manicness, but not to the same, you know, it, he didn't do it anywhere near as well. But. I, Right. It's literally the only thing I can really point to since that's come close in terms of the crazy Luther. Though Sherman How uh, though um um Clancy Brown did have a few moments, you know, in the animated universe where he essentially did it. That's cool. Specifically, you know, Superman, Batman, uh public enemies. Right. Did he just shoot heat vision straight through the mask? Yes, he did. That is yes. cool. Yeah, his powers are really getting out of hands now that the device they've built specifically to prevent his heat vision from going through is now just holes just burnt straight through it. I love that. I do wonder how Lex managed to get all the way through to what you would assume is a pretty secure area of this military base. But I guess he is Lex Luthor, you know, greatest criminal mind of our time. <laughs> yeah. 
But I, I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering why it is that Professor Peterson did not act a little bit more animated when Superboy said Luthor was just here. Yeah. You know, why didn't he, why didn't he say, "All right, what? let me get let me get security on this." Yeah, let's pull up all the CCTV in the building or something, but see if he, we can trap him before he gets out of the building. Something, yeah. you know, a little bit more urgency might have actually gone a long way in this situation, especially since we know Lex Luthor's the one that did it. If they'd managed to capture him, maybe they could have convinced him to cure Superboy. I mean, he probably wouldn't have done, but I mean, it's it's worth a shot. I've always loved this scene as well, the little twist. Both twists, actually. There's two twists in this scene, technically, aren't there? Yes. Yeah, it's funny. We talk about Superboy building a robot replica earlier in this episode. I was completely forgetting that it ends with a robot replica of Lex. And a very good one as well. You know, it's not the first time he's built robots. You know, he's done it in the comics. And it's not even the last time he'll do it in this show. Yeah. And one thing I always do like in this show, they kept the uh, running gag from Superman the movie going where he wears a different wig in almost every scene. I've always liked that little detail with Lex. Yeah, I really do wonder what they actually used to make that helmet. I mean, I'm guessing it's just plastic that they've sprayed chrome sort of metallic sort of colour, but... I don't know, I've always thought it was a pretty good looking thing. I hope it still exists somewhere. Hopefully whoever built the thing just has it in their house. <laughs> Might even be in the back room of the Superman Museum or something. Probably is, if it's still in existence. I hope it is, because it's certainly one of the cooler props slash costume pieces that this show made. It is a good twist, though, because it's interesting that Lex actually programmed the robot to be scared. Unless he's just, like, remotely controlling it with a headset or something. He probably <laughs> is. Yeah. But even so, you know, he's just messing with Superboy when he pretends that he's scared of dying at that moment. He's probably just, you know, OK, his plan has failed, but he might as well have a bit of fun before they uh, discover what's happened. It's amazing how just such a simple thing as having a smoke machine can add such a dramatic impact. Like, you didn't need digital effects in that moment. You just literally, all you needed was a smoke machine behind Sherman Howard, and that's it. Yep. And I, I see Lex's, Lex's reasoning for using the robot here. Supposing that, supposing that the, uh, the governor, you know, acts like, you know, a typical politician would and, you know, goes back on his word and harasses mm. him after after he's done. Better to have the robot arrested than Lex. It does mm. show that I this mean, Lex, Lex is, is thinks ahead. a legitimate mad genius. Yeah, he, he, he's a mad genius. He thinks ahead, and yeah, he's got he's got contingency plans in place, and uh, yeah, that is very Lex Luthor. 
Sorry, you did freeze for a minute there, so I tried to keep talking, but... <laughs> no worries, no worries. And there we go. That was um, Superboy's Deadly Touch. Um, a very fun episode. I, I do definitely think it's better than what we watched last week with Mr. and Mrs. Superboy. And it is another very funny episode, but certainly less sitcom than the last one. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what to score this one, so I'll, I'll let you. I say would say you that this, that, you know, this is, I would say between a seven point five and an eight on the season two scale. Okay, I, I I'd go maybe seven point five. So, yeah, seven point seven five maybe. Yeah, let's split the difference. You know, yeah. I it it it's it's got a it's got a good you know good story. Script is well written, mm. you know. The set design on the the laboratory that Superboy's in, very well done. You know, everything is done very well in this. You know, it, yeah. they don't, and they didn't even forget that Clark wasn't there. They had they had yeah. Andy say, "I don't know where Clark is." You know, I um, I love that. You know, I think that should happen more often. You know, if Clark is, you know busy because superboy is you know captured or whatever yeah it's the kind of thing that i appreciate when they let us know that something's happened like um i think in superboy lost just nobody seems to notice that clark isn't there i think they just say something like i think clark is ill or something i forget yeah. exactly what they said in that but lana's all waiting around for superboy to show up and nobody seems to to care that Clark has been missing the entire time, which, um, which, which, uh, you know, kind of is brought up again in the the episode. Um, that's the one, the one that we love. That is is sort of a take on uh, Alan Moore's for the man who was everything. Oh, Mindscape, right? No, it wasn't that. No, it was it was uh, Superboy. Who is Superboy? He he mentions oh, to her, yeah. you know. The problem is not me being jealous of Superboy. It's the problem. The problem is that whenever he's around, in your eyes, I disappear. You don't even notice me. Mm. So I would I would say, you know, the same thing is happening. Nobody seems to notice him. That is a good point. Yeah. Hmm. But you know, as far as this episode, you know, it's very well done. I mean, the acting is top notch, as always, with Sherman Howard. You know, the interaction between him and Tracy as uh, as Darla, great as usual. You know, and this this is really where we start to see that Lex and Darla are not just boss and employee; they are lovers. Yeah. You now they're in a relationship. Partners in crime, functional as it may be. <laughs> Partners they, in crime and lovers in the nighttime. Yeah, as they say on psych. Uh, and it and you know, as much as as I don't like that sequence when he walks down the stairs and pats Leo's skull on the on the head, I like it. I like it, how twisted it shows. L th Luther that's the reason why I don't like it because it 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 shows that it's twisted. That means that after after he disappeared from the prison at the in part one of the season opener. He He's went back blamed. to the morgue. He yeah. cut Leo's head off and then dipped it in hydrochloric acid to remove all the skin. Yeah. And not just that, like bleach the bones because that's a white looking skull, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not like, uh, uh, yeah. I know that, you know, I read this thing back when I was in high school saying, you know, when you see a skeleton in the doctor's office, which you don't even anymore, it seems. But they used to say, you know, they bleach those bones because technically skeletons are more of like a creamy brown color. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. So I guess Lex just is a really, really creepy, dark, twisted man in this universe. And yeah, I actually do quite like it because Lex seems like the kind of guy that would do something horrible like that. Yeah. I almost wish that it was he had the full skeleton not just the skull. I, I, I completely skipped over when we saw that, so I can't remember even how much was there. Was it literally it was just, just the skull? It was just the skull. I wish they'd had the full skeleton. That could have been fun. 
could have just take you know got just get a plastic skeleton from a doctor's office and just you know weather it slightly but um yeah very very creepy very creepy moment um yeah going back to something you mentioned earlier like you said about the set design i don't even just think the lab is the only like that's not even the only good set in this i think lex's lair whenever we see that just continues to look pretty cool you know it's it's low budget but it's it looks pretty decent for the show i yeah. like the fact that we've got a villain that actually has a recurring lair because you don't get that very often anymore like even back in the 60s batman show i'm pretty sure the villains had a different lair every time they appeared because it was usually yeah. key to the plot in some way um i like the fact that lex has his own sort of fortress of solitude as it were um yeah i think that worked really well and as i mentioned earlier at the lab you know it's clearly a set that was hindered a lot by the budget because you can tell how small it is but they've used their lighting in a very clever way to the point where they're hiding those limitations of their budget in a really interesting way that just instead yeah, that, of that, looking that's, cheap that's that yeah. is the 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 mark of a of a good um, set designer, set dresser, and cinematographer. They yeah. realize what they have that what they're working with and they say, okay, we gotta make it look bigger or we gotta hide how small it is. So or just add um, atmosphere, you know. Yeah. It, it's one of those things where it, that set could have ended up looking very cheap, but they in just using lighting, which they would have done anyway, you know, the lights would have been there no matter what. But they use the lighting to make it look stylish in a way. You know, it's not the most stylish thing, but there's a few shots in that lab sequence that I think look really, really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think it's a really well done set. And uh, in a show as low budget as Superboy, I think it's always important to uh, give props where due for stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I think that's one of the better uses of what was probably a very cheap looking set that superboy's ever done and uh yeah it's just a mark of a good director so kenneth bowser well done yep i don't know if i could have got a set that small looking that good uh definitely not in fact you know lighting is definitely not my forte but um yeah i think that's something worth mentioning for sure yep. i can't think of much else i wanted to say about this episode but if you do yeah, I think else? I think we've said everything that needs to be said so far. Okay. I think that's it then for this week's episode. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next week and we will see you then. Don't know what we'll be doing next week. I guess you'll find out when we do. Goodbye. Yep. <laughs>